Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. It's my great pleasure to welcome and to introduce Dr. Clu Matsiela, who graduated from the University of Stellenbosch in 2017 with a PhD in entomology. Until very recently, he was employed by SANBI, that is the South African National Biodiversity Institute. And in his present job, his work areas include the cross between agriculture management, biodiversity management, and conservation. This morning, he is going to give us an overview of the South African bee industry. He has been involved with bee-related research since 2001. And from 2018 to 21, he was the chairman of the Western Cape Bee Industry Association. His main thought is that everybody should love, respect, and look after our nature. And I think that this thought resonates with all of us, especially here in Armanus. Dr. Masiela, you are most welcome. We are very pleased that you agreed to address us this morning, and we are looking forward to your talk. Thank you very much, and thanks for the introduction. Yeah, so this is going to be a very brief talk. I won't be too long because I'm just mostly just going to touch on a few points regarding the bee industry and just not go into a lot of detail as the provinces are very different in terms of beekeeping operations. So I'll just look at a bit of the high level things in terms of where our beekeeping is in the country and what we know and what we don't know. So just to kick off, I started with an industry profile, just looking at the industry and how it is. Uh, so we know by now that the Department of Agriculture, Land Reform and Rural Development, they are the main body at the moment for beekeepers to, to register and also to enforce certain regulations. Then we've got the South African Bee Industry Organization, which is SABIO, which is the main mother body for the beekeepers in the country. But at the moment, this is also a bit in dispute because not all beekeepers are registered with SABIO and also not all provincial associations or bodies are also represented by Sabio. This goes way back uh, because of how the politics in the, in the industry are, and also there is a lot of disagreements amongst beekeepers themselves and even their association. Uh, we also see that not all provinces are represented or that they have um, a, a beekeeping bodies or associations. Uh, in fact, the Western Cape is one of the few provinces that has two associations, the Southern Cape uh, Beekeeping Association and also the Western Cape Bee Industry Association, uh, whereas the other provinces either have one or they don't have any at all. For example, the Northern Cape doesn't have a, a representative body, and then the Eastern Cape has just recently established a, a beekeeping association uh, sometime last year, I think it was September. Um, and when one looks at most of the demographics, the stats are not so very clear, but when you look at the demographics, um, you'll see that the, the beekeeping industry in South Africa is still fairly white male dominant. Um, and when you talk to a few experts, like maybe Mike Alsop from the Agricultural Research Council, you get an idea that it's an aging industry with an average age above 59 uh, of, of the beekeeper. So it's, it's quite an aging industry and it really needs some bit of a uh, a young blood to come in and take over uh, some of the beekeeping responsibility, especially when it comes to pollination. Um, I spoke a little bit about record keeping, uh, which is really one of the thorny areas for our beekeeping industry, uh, because we, we don't even have a, a single database or a reliable database where one can find out information, be it from honey production, uh, be it from what the economic contribution is from our honeybees, uh, in the agricultural sector as well, uh, employment creation, uh, poverty upliftment, and, and even when it comes to uh, the use of uh, honeybees or honeybee related products in um, pharmaceuticals, in the medicinal field and so on, because we do know that honey um, and propolis, uh, they are used very much in, in medicinal therapy or even in healing remedies um, across uh, many uh, households. And we have also seen it in a lot of European literature as well, and um, how these have been used uh, in, in the past as well. So there's really a, a need for, for a database of that sort where one can easily access information, statuses and trends of what our honeybees and their related products are used for. 
Um, and then we also have a very old beekeeping industry where not much of the technology has been used compared to countries like Australia, uh, New Zealand, the USA, and so on. I think mainly because probably our beekeepers still feel comfortable with the kind of methods that they are using for their day-to-day -day running of their beekeeping uh, operations. But we know that technology makes things a little bit more easier, um, especially when it comes to record keeping, when it comes to operating certain equipment within the beekeeping sector. And also we have seen now how um, a lot of uh, countries use the technology to track some of their hives, the performances that their bees are having in the hive, and when it's time to harvest, um, and also for security purposes. So those are still areas where our industry in South Africa hasn't explored that much. Um, then we just move a little bit ahead to the beekeeping standards. Um, the picture that you see there is actually of a hive that I took some, I think about four or five years ago uh, of one, one beekeeper. And one wouldn't expect to, to see a hive like that, but there are still beekeepers that have hives like that, which are in very, very poor condition. Um, so when we look at the, the beekeeping standards, um, we've got some that are very excellent and some that are very, very poor. Um, then we see that some associations have uh, like um, beekeeping standards. I mean, I was with the Western Cape Industry Association for about five or six years. And I know that they, they've always pushed for good beekeeping standards, uh, hive hygiene, uh, hive maintenance, and so on. And they also have a good code of, of conduct that their beekeepers must uh, follow. And it gets signed off also when you join as a member to the association. But then the, the big issue has always been about compliance and enforcement. Who monitors that everybody follows these standards? Uh, who makes sure that uh, everybody adheres and um, that their standards of beekeeping are at an acceptable level? Uh, but yeah, that, that's another area that one would want to look at. And I think I'll touch on it again when I talk about the involvement of of government and, and, and inspection uh, services. Then we also look at inspection services and audits for, for pollination. Um, not all associations across the provinces have these services in place, uh, simply because sometimes no one wants to pay for them. Um, and also they cannot afford to have a, a full-time inspector or someone doing the audits on their books because it's, it's quite an, a costly uh, exercise as well. And also because, uh, I mean, with my experience in the Western Cape, there are also politics that come into play. Or oh, one beekeeper wouldn't want another beekeeper inspecting their hives um, because of maybe certain reservations they have or that they feel that they are the only ones that can only work on their hives. So in most instances, these inspections and audits are only done when the growers or the farmers request them, and they also have to pay for those services uh, themselves. Uh, the fees can also differ uh, depending on the type of inspection that needs to be done. But yeah, they're also always not, not carried through. Uh, then in the past few years, we've seen agricultural companies um, such as uh, Bayer and also CropLife South Africa uh, coming on to assist together with HotGrow to, ve to develop some of what we call the best practice guidelines or pollination charters. Uh, just really just to detail um, mostly the practices that both the growers and the beekeepers need to follow, especially when it comes to pollination, uh, because we have seen in the past how our honeybees um, really get wiped out or get killed because of uh, irresponsible application of uh, certain pesticides. And these are the practices that still continue from season in, season out. Uh, because uh, um, some of the growers are still not applying pesticides according to the label or according to the best practices or, or, or charters that have been developed by these institutions. But that's one area that has really improved over the last five to six years compared to how it was in the past 10 years, where, when, where really um, the, some, some beekeepers would just complain about pesticides coming in their colonies, but no one would be doing anything about it. And then we just quickly jump onto honey production. Like I said, uh, the numbers are not clear. Uh, Sabio does publish their South African Bee Journal almost every quarter, and they try and update these stats, but they are not always accurate. Um, so we, we really don't have an, 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 a clear number of 
how much honey is being produced in South Africa. Uh, but then there are estimates uh, which might be old. Uh, someone might have new numbers. But the last numbers I think I got from West Grow uh, a year or two ago was that South Africa was still producing less than 1,500 tons uh, of honey per annum. Uh, some of us think that number is quite low. Uh, others think um, it could be accurate. Um, then we know that we've got huge amounts of imports. I've got a number of about 3,000 tons. Um, I know some people might say it's even above that, even close to 5,000 tons. Uh, but these numbers are just difficult to, 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 to get. And I'll get to that also when I talk about government involvement, when I talk about the, just the, the, the monitoring of, of the ports in terms of imports and exports as well. Um, then we see that there are quite a few variables that have led to the, in, uh, this, the unstable number of uh, honey production units uh, and also why in some instances we feel that the numbers have gone down. Um, in the Western Cape, you'll be very much familiar with the, the gum removals or the eucalyptus story, um, simply because we know that in South Africa, 60% uh, of the honey we produce used to come from eucalyptus. But over the years, I think since uh, 2009, 2010 or so, a lot of the gum removals through a few initiatives just to conserve water and so on in, in riparian zones and catchment areas have, have really led to, to beekeepers losing a few good sites where they were relying on gums for that. Also, there have been changes in the forestry industry when they bring in new cultivars and new varieties for their own timber production and so on. Uh, but then those don't always uh, flower at the time that the bees need them. Some of them don't even flower at all because they are more focused on fast growing trees maybe with even um, thinner barks and so on, depending what their industry uh, is looking to achieve in terms of their market target. Um, then in the last few years, this has made headlines quite a few times, the issue of theft and vandalism on, on hives. It's been big, big problems in uh, the Western Cape, uh, KwaZulu-Natal, and also some areas of Mpumalanga um, province where um, beekeepers have lost high hive numbers due to theft and vandalism as well. Then for the Western Cape, uh, the Northern Cape, uh, and a little bit of the Eastern Cape as well, uh, drought has been a huge, huge issue the past, uh, I would just say eight years, but it's been variable from year to year. And then in the Western Cape in particular, we've lost quite a lot of vegetation to fires. And you'll know that Fainbos takes quite a lot of time to regenerate or to recover. So beekeepers sometimes find themselves not being able to use those sites for at least four to six years before the vegetation can recover again. Then we also have competing land use practices um, where we've got settlements, uh, whether legal or illegal in certain areas that are now clearing vegetation to make way for people to either erect homes. Uh, we've seen also informal settlements in a lot of areas uh, where beekeepers cannot use those areas anymore because if you still use them, then you left to deal with theft and vandalism uh, in those areas that are close to, to those informal settlements. Um, yeah, then we've also seen new developments, uh, be it either uh, residential complexes or, or factory sites in certain areas that have also taken up most of the forage that the beekeepers would use uh, to keep their bees. Um, and then one which is a bit controversial, which is around the conservation management practices. Um, this is mostly has, has mostly affected the Western Cape where a few years ago, Cape Nature and Sun Parks uh, took a bit of a resolution and a stand that they would not allow beekeepers into nature reserves or in conservation areas because of certain concerns around competition of resources between managed honeybees and other pollinators, and also safety issues for bikers, hikers on trails and so on, uh, because they feel that uh, uh, at high, high, high numbers might pose a threat uh, to some of their visitors in those parks. So that has also led to beekeepers being shut out uh, in, in, in most of, of, of these um, conservancy areas where some of them would have had access before. Um, then when we look at uh, South African honey exports, um, some of us used to think that South Africa doesn't export honey at all. But from time to time, when you speak to a few beekeepers, you, you get to realize that there is a little bit of honey that's been exported to certain markets uh, in, in certain countries. 
uh, strictly not, not not Europe because we we've got certain regulations uh, that we uh, cannot satisfy or comply with. Uh, but there's a small number of beekeepers that still do export honey to to other countries. Um, then when we look at South Africa's honey market, um, there's a a lady, uh, Dr. Nanike van der Westeze, who's just done very nice research in the West Coast, looking at uh, South Africa's unique honey or the Fainbos unique honey and also medicinal properties. Uh, I know she completed her studies. She was at, at Stellenbosch as well about two years ago. Uh, quite very interesting research that one would want to look at. And, and, and this is really an area where I think South Africa's honey really falls short because we've got very good vegetation that is unique in the world, very good climate and so on. And there's really an opportunity to market South African honey as unique honey based on its um, sort of area or region of, 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 of uh, as you would know that the Fenbos is, is one of the, the biodiversity hotspots of the world uh, due to its unique vegetation. So there's quite a, a unique market and opportunity there for honey to, to be looked at in that way. But in terms of medicinal properties, we also still don't know much about uh, the types of honeys that we have that could really um, point to a, a use of medicinal purposes. Uh, but I'm, I'm sure that there might be people that are more knowledgeable in this sub subject area than I do. But, but from you know, speaking to some of the guys in the industry and just looking at the literature, we still have a lot of work to do here when it comes to just establishing the medicinal properties or the potential thereof that our honeys have in the country. Um, then we look at the pollination services, which is uh, the big buzzword now um, in the country and in other countries as well, because this is where beekeepers now make most of their money uh, than they would in, in honey production or, or through selling propolis or beeswax or any other bee related product. Um, then when we look at the pollination services that uh, maybe just as a bit of a background, um, uh, we know that in, in South Africa, we have about close to 50 crops that rely on insect pollination. And most of that pollination is done by, by managed honeybees because just of the dynamics and the structure of how our agricultural system is. It's not, it's not small scale or, or, or uh, 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 of mostly of emerging farmers, we've got big tracts of, of apples, pears, plums, and now the blueberries are also a big thing in the market as well, uh, avocados, macadamias, and they keep on shifting from provinces to provinces uh, because of the climatic conditions and the new cultivars that, that come into these areas. And so there's quite a strong need for, for pollination services and the numbers keep growing uh, annually. When, when you talk to, to the beekeepers and some of the experts in, in, in the field. So we see that in this area, we, we have beekeepers that really have good hives uh, that they send into pollination, but others are bad. Uh, most of you might know that there are even legal cases in, in provinces like Mpumalanga, where some of the beekeepers would send in hives that are almost half empty and the farmers end up with failed crops because those hives have not managed uh, to, to successfully deliver a desired pollination service that they have paid for. Uh, then the farmers and the growers also need to do their own audits before pollination, which is not always easy because when you're running um, massive, massive farms and you require 2,000, 3,000 hives for pollination, it is really very difficult to inspect each and every hive uh, that comes into pollination. But we always encourage uh, the farmers to pay for that pollination inspection or that pollination audit so that they also happy that when they get the hives, it is hives of good standard. It is hives that can come in and do the work for their crops that they need. Um, and like I said, it's a big money area for, for beekeepers. Um, and there's no real agreement on pollination prices. Um, the Western Cape Bee Industry Association does set a, a pollination tariff guideline each and every year around this time of the year, March or April, just after their AGM. Um, last year, the pollination price was just above a thousand rand. Um, I haven't seen the, the new pollination price for this year, but it, it fluctuates, also affected by factors such as uh, uh, the petrol price, uh, electricity, beekeepers have to drive around a lot, so, so fuel does become a big, big factor. And over the years, because of the diminishing uh, forage resources for bees, 
beekeepers have also had to feed more and more to keep their hives going and in an up phase for production. So they're also paying high costs uh, for, for bee feed for both protein and carbohydrates. So they need to recoup that somehow back into uh, their operational system. So a lot of that pollination price is also managed uh, around that in terms of their input costs. And the pollination price is always based around uh, 14 days or more, uh, but mostly it's anything between 14 and 21 days. And that's when a, a hive will be in for pollination. Uh, and then the price just, just sits around it. And it also differs from one crop to the other. Uh, some crops are pricier than the others in terms of pollination, just because of the period of time that the bees have to be in there. And also because some crops don't have any reward or there's very little reward in terms of pollen and nectar that the bees can can get from that particular crop so the bees do take a bit of a strain and stress when going into pollination and then the beekeepers need to factor that in somehow um then there's also still a big debate on what we call pollination stocking rates across the different crops and cultivars uh, for example the number of hives you would use for apples uh, per hectare would differ from what you can use for plums or what you can use for avocados or what you can use for kiwis uh, and so on. And also within the crops themselves, the stocking rates also differ per cultivar. Uh, uh, for, for example, with, uh, uh, with, uh, with apples, what the number of hives you would use on Granny Smith or on Pink Ladies wouldn't be the same uh, across the, uh, the, those cultivars. But then we, we still lack a little bit of research in understanding some of these dynamics. And what also makes it even more difficult is that you, you find farms that don't only do one type of crop. Um, so you'll find a farm that does plums, that does pears, and they also do apples as well. And they are very much close to each other. So managing those stocking rates also becomes a bit of an issue. Um, I think where it's starting to come right, it's, it's in areas like uh, blueberries where they are mostly in tunnels or in nets, uh, which is not ideal for bees, but in there at least one can be able to control the numbers that they can bring in for, for pollination. So like I said, there's still a lot of research gaps in, in, in us trying to understand um, the pollination services and demands uh, and what the supply should look like in most of those areas. But what has been clear and now, and, and I'm sure a lot of you would have seen in the media since last year or so, is that we are going to need more and more bees uh, for pollination. And simply because um, our agricultural system is so broad and it's expanding. So most of the farms are far away from natural habitat or vegetation where they would have benefited from um, other native or wild pollinators adjacent to those lands. And when you don't have that natural setup where you can have the benefit of other pollinators, you now only rely on managed honeybees to be brought in specifically for pollination of those particular crops. And that's why those demands are increasing because there's just a huge expansion in some of the crops within the agricultural sector. Then when we look at uh, uh, pests, diseases and management, this is really another weak area uh, for South Africa as well. Uh, most of you might only heard about the American fowl brood, which is very prevalent in the Western Cape, very seasonal as well, uh, because mostly driven by weather conditions and also hive management and, 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 and hygiene. So we, we really don't have a good uh, sort of uh, stock taking when it comes to the prevalence of certain uh, diseases, uh, pests, uh, uh, parasites, uh, viruses, and so on. And unless, you know, one beekeeper reports a problem in a certain area. Uh, but Mike Alsop from the ARC is, is one of the leading guys uh, in, in this area. And he's been dealing with a lot of uh, issues when it comes to pests and, and diseases in, in the country. Um, and then, um, so what, what we also see is uh, most of you might also be familiar with what we call the Capensis problem, um, which mostly affects the northern parts uh, of the country, the other provinces, except the Western Cape. And this is really when you have uh, the, the Capensis subspecies, uh, which is restricted to the winter rainfall region. So that's the bee that we have in the Western Cape. 
uh, moving over to the Sputalata area or the Savannah B region. And there's a hybridization that takes place. And, and over time, uh, the capensis just manages to take over that hive and it just weakens the productivity of that hive because it's not suited biologically to be in those environments and also to perform in that area. And also the new offsprings from the hybridization do not do well at all. So this has been a recurring problem for the Northern provinces. Um, they haven't managed to sort it out. It's also very seasonal uh, because in some years you don't hear about it at all. And then in the other years, it becomes really, really a big problem. Um, then I've also spoken about, we don't have real data on things like varroa mites, uh, viruses, uh, bee pirates, and predation by wasps. We actually have a new student that's working on looking at Vespilla germanica, uh, the German wasp and its predation on native insects and bees as well. Um, so unlike what we see in, with the Asian hornets, uh, where we know that they do go for, for beehives and they can literally kill out an entire hive in, a half, in half a day or in a day, uh, here we, we haven't really had a good solid research in terms of the impact that the alien invasive wasp, which is the Germanica, is currently having on, 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 on beehives. But from time to time, when you talk to beekeepers, they do report some of the predation that takes place where these wasps do attack honeybees or they literally sit at the entrances of some of these hives and bees cannot go out to forage the whole day and the productivity of that hive just, just drops uh, because they are staying there trying to protect the hive while they are also being attacked or being killed uh, when they try to exit the hives to go and forage. Um, I think uh, this just comes up again in terms of uh, record keeping uh, when it comes to uh, the impacts any of these pests and the disease, diseases might be having on the hives. It's very few beekeepers that can really tell you which of their sites have been impacted the most or what number of hives uh, they have lost due to any of those diseases and pests that they are struggling to manage in, in, in certain areas. Then I just go over quickly to government involvement, training and support in terms of transformation. This is a very debatable area as well, because it depends who you talk to, how long they've been in, in the industry and what areas they have been involved in. Uh, but yeah, there's, there's a bit of a, an agreement that there's been a limited support uh, from government to the beekeeping industry in certain areas. Um, and that when it does happen, it's not that interactive. It doesn't change a lot of things and year in and year out, beekeepers still complain about certain things. Um, over the years also, we have seen uh, certain institutions that were responsible for bee research in the country, just really going down in terms of capacity, uh, funding and also support. And they are, not being, they are not able to do the work that they're supposed to do to support the industry like they would have done uh, back in the days. Um, then I've spoken about enforcement, inspections and audits, uh, disease management and border control. These are really some of the core functions that should have been happening at government level, either from a provincial side of things or even at national uh, from the Department of, of Agriculture. But these are some of the areas that have just uh, deteriorated over the years. Uh, some of you would have heard how people would complain about honey from maybe China or so on, uh, the lack of irradiation for, for that honey that comes through our ports. Um, I, I spoke about the, the number of honey uh, units or imports that come into the country, how we don't have good numbers on those because of the border control measures that we have not been working really very well. And also in terms of enforcement and compliance, where some of the beekeepers are still operating uh, without being fully registered as per requirements of the regulations and the laws, uh, because we know now that beekeepers and even bee removers uh, are, should by law be registered if they are to practice with, within any beekeeping activities in the country. But in all these areas, there's just really lack of uh, proper enforcement, uh, monitoring, and really consequence management for those that are not complying. So this is one area that needs to be looked at. And then we know that over the years, government has spent millions and millions of rents uh, training beekeepers, especially um, 
black beekeepers or emerging beekeepers, especially in provinces like the Eastern Cape, uh, Houghton, Limpopo, and the Northwest as well. And, and some of the, these beekeepers have also been given a lot of startup equipment uh, for them to start their beekeeping operations. Uh, but after two to three years, those beekeepers, they just fall off the radar. Uh, you don't know what happened to them because there's not proper support, uh, mentoring as well, that's also given to them. And the difficult one being them having access to, to market uh, for their products. Uh, because uh, especially with honey, a lot of uh, honey that's on our market is imported honey. So where do all the local honey go to? You know, why doesn't it penetrate some of our retail market or our chain stores? Uh, so that's where the big problem still lies. And also just professionalizing the industry as well. Uh, we still have uh, issues of representation, issues of unity within the industry. Uh, we still have uh, issues of uh, beekeepers just, that just operate under the radar and, and no one is holding them accountable for that. And that also contributes to, to some of the conflicts that I spoke to earlier in terms of beekeepers not wanting to to, to, to belong to certain uh, beekeeping bodies or associations in, in different provinces. So this is something that really needs to change if the industry is really to become a, a bit more professional and be in a, run in a way that is also representative, representative of an example of whether, what other uh, agricultural industries uh, are, are doing within the country. Um, then the last one that I'll look at is in terms of the research gaps and needs in South Africa. Uh, these are many. I've just picked a few that are a little bit of high level. Um, I've spoken slightly about how the capacity has just gone down in terms of uh, the manpower for doing bee research in the country and also how there's a lack of funds and support uh, from government and other private institutions when it comes to, to bee research and what we need to know and what needs to be done in the country on this. Um, one of uh, the topics that I have on top of the list is just research on pesticides and, and pollution. Most of you would know that, especially in Europe and uh, in, in, the, in America as well, there's been quite an alarming rate at which um, the reporting on pesticides and their effect on or not only on, on bees, but other pollinators as well. Uh, research is also starting to show how it affects certain bird species as well. Um, but in South Africa, we have very, very limited research on this. And most of the action that we take either to suspend or to ban certain pesticides is always drawn from European literature or action that is taken by some of the European bodies when it comes to uh, pesticides in general. I'll just use pesticides in general, but most of you will also know about neonicotinoids and so on that have really made headlines in some of the areas. Um, then we've got, as I said before, lack of research when it comes to understanding the pest dynamics, the diseases, the pathogens, the viruses and so on, which is really very critical if we are to understand how we manage and sustain our bee population um, over time so that they can remain productive, not only to, to, to support our natural vegetation, but also for uh, to support the agricultural sector as well. Um, through some of the work that I did with my colleagues and, and other partners, like the uh, University of uh, Stellenbosch, University of Pretoria also does a lot of good work on this, is really uh, looking at uh, the forage resources that our bees rely on, the plants that they need for them to survive, looking at the pollen and nectar. I think over the last 10 years, we have done quite some incredible research on this, uh, looking at the different provinces, at the different flowering times and so on, but there's still a lot of work that needs to be done in, in this area as well. Um, there are a few uh, people that have also tried to establish pollen libraries as a reference for a geographical um, classification of certain forage uh, in, in those areas, and, and they've done quite a good job in, the, in those areas, but there's still a lot that can be done. Um, and then uh, the topic that everybody talks about these days, uh, the impact of climate change. We've got very little to no research that's happening on our bees uh, when it comes to, to climate change, how they would be impacted, uh, what the, uh, the shift in, in seasonal variations, uh, flowering times and so on of certain plants will, 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 will do or what will happen to bees in this, in this instance. 
and also uh, in terms of their productivity level. Uh, we, we've heard about the increase of the, the two degrees in temperature, but we don't know how this is going to affect how our bees and their productivity. So there's still a lot of research that needs to happen in this area. Then we look at genetics and migratory beekeeping. Uh, you would know that our beekeepers, they travel around, they move uh, bees either from Hout Bay to Rabo, from Hermanas to Stanford, uh, all of those areas, just for them to try and access good forage. And also during pollination season, uh, bees get moved uh, all, all the way up to Lanesburg. Um, we know there are bees that go up to Old Swaring as well. Uh, so there's quite a lot of movement, but we don't know what that is doing to the genetics uh, of some of the bees that the bees that are being moved into those areas happen when they, uh, what happens when they get to mix with other populations, be it either be managed populations or wild population. So that's one area that needs to be looked at to see how the gene pool is behaving uh, in between the managed bees and, and the wild bees. We don't like to separate them because it's the same subspecies, but it's always nice to, to, to differentiate when we talk about them because uh, uh, the bees that get to travel or to be moved long distances are the ones that are kept in the hives or the boxes by the, the beekeepers. And then theft and vandalism, I've spoken about this before, but it's one of the big cost areas for beekeepers uh, when it comes to them maintaining security for where they put their hives, uh, be either on public or private land. Uh, but we still don't understand what drives uh, these acts of theft and vandalism fully. There are speculations around uh, beekeepers stealing other beekeepers' hives to use them for pollination, uh, others just vandalizing and stealing the honey to sell it. But all these dynamics are not fully understood. So it's, 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 um, it will be um, a bit of a speculations if one was to pinpoint one or two factors that are driving it. Then I spoke about hive hygiene and, and uh, maintenance and management as well, which is a, is a big area uh, because if you are to sustainably maintain and manage your hive for longer period for good productivity, you need to make sure that your bees are doing well. You need to make sure that they are disease free, they are virus free, pathogen free, so that they can also thrive to carry on over to the next generation and that you can use them uh, for longer periods uh, for, for pollination uh, purposes and also for, for honey production as well. Then I spoke about the honey, uh, the pollination dynamics as well, when it comes to how many hives per hectare are needed for pollination across the different crops, the different cultivars, and so on. So these are some of the areas where there's still a lot of uh, research that needs to be done. So for some of you that might be interested or still have a bit of free time on your hands, uh, some of these projects can really be started uh, just by you just observing what happens in your backyards, with, especially when the climate change issues. You know, if your trees and your plants are still flowering at the same time each year, are you still having the same number of bees or other insects visiting your garden at the same time of the year? And one could really create a good journal that can paint a, a picture just through those observations in terms of what is happening when when certain conditions uh, of rainfall and, 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 and temperatures just change annually within, within your, your small setup or, or the gardens. And that could over time just tell a picture of what could be happening in those areas. So these are some of the areas that I just wanted to cover for today as an overview. And that just concludes my presentation. And thank you very much for your attention. And I'm, I'm flexible to take any questions. May I just come in here? Jean Fora, Dr. Marcella, it's fascinating talk that you've given us. I recently visited Barrydale. There was a farm, we spoke to a farmer who's growing onions and carrots, but basically focusing on seed production. And they used flies to pollinate their, their plants because of the shortage of bees. Can you perhaps comment on that? Onions are always a tricky crop uh, because I, I know that in some of the areas in the Karoo as well, they do bring in bees to do pollination on onions for, for seed. But over the years, there have been times when bees don't even want to work on onions and they can't even pinpoint what's in that, whether it's the smell of the onions or whether it's uh, some of the fibers that they use and so on. 
Then when it comes to the, the shortage, what we have seen, especially in the Western Cape, is that in the past, I would say four years or so, is that some of the crops are flowering very close to each other. And uh, we have seen it as well in the Hrabo Valley, where now in one period, there's a huge demand for bees in those areas. And if you don't get into contracts early with some of the beekeepers, you'll find yourself scrambling for hives when the time comes. And then when you talk about them using flies and so on, I wouldn't be surprised because remember uh, some, some like blueberries, for example, we know that we use the honeybees for pollination of blueberries, but in the most of their countries of origin, honeybees are not even used for pollination at all. So you can use get some of the insects that can still do the same level of pollination or give you the same amount of productivity level uh, than you would uh, uh, when using honeybees. But I mean, I've, I've never worked on, on, on flies that can be used for carrot and, and, and onion seed production. So it will be interesting to see what setup or management they have. And if they really have a good number of those flies that, that they can use. Do you perhaps know which, which uh, fly species they, they use at all? Now, Forty, I don't know the details, but it was fascinating. Yeah, thank you so much. Yeah, yeah no, it, it would be very interesting just to see which species they are using. And I'm sure very good uh, results in terms of seed size and seed weight as well, uh, because of the pollination that can be run that by, by those mm -hmm. particular flies. Thank you for that, Dr. Ford. Anybody else with a question? What is the lifespan of a bee? Thank you very much. Um, <laughs> Some of the questions that sometimes we just forget to address uh, ahead of time because we, we take it that most people are, are bee lovers now. So mo mostly, so we've got um, three types of bees in a hive. Uh, we've got the queen, uh, and you can only get one queen in a hive at a time. It's got a lifespan of about three to five years. And then we've got drones, which are called the male bees. Uh, they hardly leave the hive at all. Uh, they only leave the hive for mating with the queen uh, during a particular mating time. Very defenseless, very lazy. They hardly do anything in the hive just to be fed and wait. And they, they just may wait to mate with the, with the queen. And then we've got the, the worker bees, which we call the ladies. Those are the females. They do all the work in the hive. The nurse bees cleaning the hive, protecting the hive and so on. And they've got a lifespan of anything between 28 and 36 days. It differs from season to season. So you'll see in a lot of literature, they'll talk about what they call about early spring bees or late spring bees or summer bees and winter bees. So depending when, when they hatch and how much food is available coming into the hive and how much they work and how much they forage, their, their lifespan can be between anything of those 28 to about 36 days. Thank you very much. Anybody else? What can we do in our gardens to encourage bees to come and not to use pesticides? We do know, but is there anything else? No, ab absolutely. There's, there's always something we, we can do. Um, in our gardens specifically, one of the things I always preach is just that bees, just like us, they need a healthy, pollutant-free environment. So if you can even put out a little bit of a water for them out there uh, if you can just make sure if you're you're changing plants or bringing in new plants in your garden talk to the nursery close to you you know ask them what bee friendly plants they have because a lot of nurseries have that now where they've got like they group their plants according to to certain categories bee friendly moisture retention nutrient fixing and so on and just ask them about the bee friendly plants and so on and, and also some of the weeds that we like to take out in our gardens, you know, some of them are very useful to bees. And uh, so some of them like your dandelions and so on, you can just leave them a little bit longer until they finish flowering before you pull them out or you cut and trim them so that the bees can, can use them. And then in terms of uh, if you want to control weeds, instead of just using your harsher chemicals or pesticides, uh, they are more, I don't want to use the, the word organic or, or, or bee friendly plants, but just look at the labels of, of those particular herbicides or insecticides that you use around your garden. Uh, they, they normally have a, a, a bit of a guide in terms of their friendliness, in terms of the environment and not just to, to bees alone. And, and one can just use those particular uh, products if, if there's a need to do so. Yes, we're very lucky in Amonis because we have uh, the fan balls around us. 
And of course, the bees are very keen to, to, to use the nectar of the flame balls. Any more questions? This lady wants to know whether the bees can be fed while they're pollinating. She uh, thinks that they will pollinate but not be fed at the same time. That's a very loaded question, and farmers don't like that. The, the growers don't like that. The, there are a lot of beekeepers that motivate. Like if you look at things like butternut, what other crop can I think of? Onion is also a very good example uh, because there's very little that bees get from onions, uh, uh, butternut. Uh, I'll just think maybe of another example quickly. Where when bees go into pollination for those particular crops, very little nectar. Uh, obviously, the pollen goes into the cross-pollination of the different crops and so on. And a lot of beekeepers want to take hives that have feeders on them so that they can either feed sugar water or they can feed pollen and nectar substitutes on them. But the farmers don't want that because then they are saying that you, you're rendering the, the bees to be lazy. So now they can't go out and work on, on the crops. So they literally force them to, to work on that. And that's why even on some of the farms, you'll see that uh, when your pears, your plums, they are flowering, they will normally cut out or trim out all the weeds around the field or even between uh, the tree rows or hedges because they don't want the bees being distracted by anything that's flowering next to those trees. So they are forced to work there. So it would be good to feed in some of the areas and some beekeepers do feed, but I can tell you the farmers would not agree with you at all. Can you give us an indication of what it costs a farmer who farms with, say, for instance, sunflowers uh, to mm -hmm. have his, his uh, crop pollinated? Okay, if maybe you can just allow me, I can talk particularly for the Western Cape because I've worked in, in the Western Cape for, for quite a few years on, on that research. So we, we used to have prices for, for apples and pears and plums which would be a standard price of, like I was saying, last year it was around a thousand, just around a thousand below 1,200 rand for 14 days. That's a, we work on 14 to 21 days because the, the, the fruit trees, they, they flower for that period. Anything after that, you're, you're not gonna get much. When you look at crops like blueberries, for example, it will also depend whether you are under nets or you're under tunnels or you are in an open field. And then for blueberries, sometimes the farmer can pay anything from 1,500 to 1,700 for those 14 to 21 days. But then you get beekeepers that operate under the radar, that want to undercut other beekeepers, and they'll still charge 500 or 600 and rent a hive for those 14 to 21 days, which doesn't really do the industry that, that good because then you want to maintain a certain uh, pollination standard. And also for people to pay for a good service that they would get. And then you get crops that, like, for example, macadamia, which is called the new oil of the agricultural industry in South Africa, because they are just almost everywhere now, uh, the macadamias. And there's very big, big competition on pollination for macadamias. And there you get a range of anything between 800 and 1,200 hives. But just like some of you would know with the almonds in the, in the California, where the hives go in and they don't come back because of the harsh pesticides that have been used, on those particular crops, macadamia also have a bad reputation, unfortunately, of hives going in and not coming back. If you take 100 hives, you know that you will probably come back with, if you come back with 60, 70 plus, you are more than lucky uh, mm -hmm. because of just how the management is of, of those areas. So some beekeepers wouldn't want to go into certain crops at all because they know that the hives coming out, sometimes you don't see the effects immediately, but two, three, four weeks down the line, your hives just start dropping one by one. And, and four months down the line, you have lost almost 50% of your hives. I suppose you want to know whether, what, what the legal status is. The legal status of abandoned bees in a hive. Okay. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and is this like a, a formal hive structure that a beekeeper would use, like your normal box? Yes, yes. Okay. So if that beekeeper is registered, like I said, through the Department of Agriculture, each hive must be marked with a number. Usually when you are in the Western Cape, it will be, they are, they are all CA numbers. And then now they've got the WC numbers. They are, they are all a bit provincial now. So if, if you are in Gauteng, it would be a GP number, for example. In Pumalanga, it would be an MP number. So that number, if you call or you email any of the local associations, now it's even nicer because we've got WhatsApp groups as well. 
And I know that the, the, the POPIA Act has made things very difficult for, for some of the people because you can't, you can't just give out information now. But what we used to do, you can ask who this WC136 belongs to, and then whoever is the secretary or the chairperson of the association can come back to you and say, okay, this hive belongs to Mr. Pretorius. Here is his number. And then, you know, if you can arrange for him to collect that hive, then it can be done so. But beekeepers are very naughty as well. I know in the, especially in the Hermanas area, through by, we've had a lot of calls where a person would say, I just woke up this morning and there are like 25 hives around my yard. I don't know who dropped them here because they are so desperate to access forage and they would do that knowing that in two weeks time they can come back and harvest honey or pick up the hives again. But that's one of the ways you can trace them. Uh, beekeepers know each other in most of the areas. So that number that they should have on the hive when they mark their hive, that's the one that you can use through the Department of Agriculture or the other associations to, to see who it belongs to and then to get in contact. Thank you, Doctor, for your well-prepared presentation. It's been very interesting. I have two questions. One is you spoke of the insect and uh, fungal type threats as pests to bees. I don't think I heard you mention anything about honey badgers. I know in some areas, honey badgers are a major factor in terms of damaging hides. Could you comment on that, please? The second question, I was disappointed to hear about the amount of money being spent on training people to take on hives and then that they were falling off the radar. Some years ago, I read about a very successful project in Mpumalanga where there was a an entrepreneur who set up a processing plant uh, to harvest the honey and that uh, the rural African people were given uh, hives that they could install in the areas around where there was gums and various other suitable producing plants and that honey was then collected in the frames taken to the processing plant and the rural people had a major benefit from that. Are those the sort of people that are falling by the wayside now? Because I think it's a huge opportunity for rural Africans to develop uh, business skills using the bees doing the work. Thank you. Absolutely, and thanks for the two questions. I'll just start with the last one. So th there have been a, a, a few good examples of, of projects that have come through. Like there was one project in the Vembe district uh, in, in Limpopo province. Uh, where the Department of Agriculture really did a, a great job. And I think there are still about close to 300 plus beekeepers that are still running that operation. But then you, you have a few where like money has just gone down the drain, and unfortunately. But beekeeping has been shown in a lot of areas, countries like Botswana, Swaziland, Zambia is also one good example where some of these beekeeping projects for, for rural communities have really brought in skills, a bit of uh, economic benefits so that uh, families can start providing for, for themselves as well. So you, you do get such good cases where you've got very good examples. But then you also get people that just get all these government contracts to train beekeepers and they just do a fly-by-night job and three or four months. I mean, um, myself and a few other guys, some of you might know Yaku uh, Wolfart from Swellendam. We, we've done and assisted some beekeepers in the Eastern Cape a few years ago. I think it was between 2011 and 13. And, and within two years, there was about 6 million that was spent in that project. And the whole consortium just, just collapsed. You know, sometimes it starts with the politics. Sometimes the community themselves, they fight for certain resources and positions within those co-ops and consortiums and, and, and they just collapse. So when you see those kind of things, it's not a nice thing to see. Uh, but in, in areas where they've worked well, it's really great that they are, they, are, they, are, they are coming through. Then I think the first question you was mostly asking about the honey badgers. So if you could remember well, the, the honey badgers used to be a protected species in South Africa because their numbers were very low. And then the WWF came up with a very nice initiative uh, where you could see some of the honeys used to have that honey badger sticker on them because they were vandal in, in some of the areas, especially where hives were kept in nature reserves and so on, there was quite a lot of issues with badger vandalisms on hives and so on. So to protect the badgers by then, uh, they came up with this badger friendly sort of initiative or sort of a stewardship of some sort so that they would encourage beekeepers not to kill the badgers if they are vandalizing hives in their areas and so on. 
But then I don't know what happened with that program because I hardly even see any honey with badger friendly stickers on them anymore. There are still a, a few out there, but very low numbers. But then over time, also the badger population has really recovered in the country. I think now they are on the IUCN red list species. I think they are on list concern now, unlike when they were vulnerable or threatened back in the days. And um, so they are, as far as I'm aware, there are not as many issues as they with badgers as they used to be back in the days. From time to time, I see on a few WhatsApp groups, people would share some videos and so on, but the, the situation is not as bad as it used to be back then. Thank you. Is there a way in which you keep the Capensis species away from the northern species? Unfortunately not, because like I said, beekeepers are naughty. <laughs> <laughs> we still get issues. It's just that I haven't spoken to one of the Department of Agriculture person in the Western Cape in a while. Uh, some of you might, might know him, Rian van Zeil. I know in the Western Cape, we had a case a year and a half ago of a beekeeper who tried to bring bees from the Eastern Cape down into the Western Cape. You still get such cases where, where people will, will try and risk it to bring bees either from higher areas of the Northern Cape into the bit of the Orange River side, because that's also a very bit of a sensitive line where there's a lot of onion seed and carrot seed and also a watermelon pollination that's going on there. But yeah, we do have laws and regulations in place that prohibits beekeepers from taking bees from the Western Cape up into the other provinces and the other way around. But you do get naughty beekeepers that still try. Well, thank you very much for this wonderful talk. I'm still fascinated by what you could uh, tell us. But the first time I thought, my goodness, I didn't know so much about uh, bees and beekeeping. Now I know a little more. And I hope that you will still be involved with the bee industry, although you have started a new job, because we need people like you to look after our bees. Thank you very much for, for, for doing this for us. We're privileged to have listened to you, and we're looking forward to your next lecture. Thank you very much.